All right, in this segment, what I'm going to be focusing on is a short review of natural and sexual selection. And then I'm also going to talk about social role theory, which is another way of explaining sex differences in behavior. And just so you know, I am doing this on my front porch, so you may hear the cicadas in the background or a car driving by periodically. Hopefully it's not terribly distracting. All right, so I just wanted to review what we talked about last week uh, with natural selection. And I wanted to draw your attention to a video that I've posted on evolution. It is 10 minutes long, but I showed it in my Tuesday class, and many of the students felt that it was really helpful for uh, explaining the processes of natural selection and answering maybe some of their concerns and questions. So I really do encourage you to take a look at that video. Uh, often, I think I mentioned this in class, often when we talk about evolution, people will say, oh, that, that's survival of the fittest. And I think I emphasized in class that it really isn't about survival of the fittest. Survival's nice, but really the key part is this issue of reproduction. So in order for these good genes, like the genes over here in the bre that produce the brown beetles, in order for those to be of any use, they really need to be passed down from generation to generation to generation. And so that means that maybe we need to change that phrase to uh, reproduction of the fittest. And then we also need to keep in mind what is meant by fit or fitness. And for that, we can look to this sentence right here about suitability to the environment. So fitness refers to um, an individual member of a species, their ability to adapt to the environment, their ability to survive, and of course, their ability to reproduce. All right, so we want to talk about reproduction of those who are most well suited for the environment. That's the core thing of, of natural selection. Now, with evolutionary psychology, I do want to say that this is actually a fairly controversial field in psychology. There are some people who feel like evolution does a great job of explaining findings in psychology, and then there's uh, definitely a lot of people who, although they believe in evolution, don't think that it does a very good job of explaining certain things in psychology. So maybe take it with a grain of salt. The idea behind it is that natural selection uh, produces certain or passes on certain genes and those genes lead to the creation of organs like the brain um, and proteins like neurotransmitters that can produce particular types of behavior. So when we talked in class last week, um, we talked about this idea that we may have evolved a preference for really fatty, calorie intensive food because those people who had those preferences would have been more likely to survive in a famine. Uh, we can also think that maybe uh, we would have evolved an ability to detect angry faces because if I'm, and it turns out that's true, we are actually faster at detecting angry faces than we are happy faces or sad faces. And this may have been that because people who weren't very good at detecting anger uh, may not have registered um, danger from other humans or social isolation from other humans and therefore would have died off. Those of us who are especially good at detecting angry faces would have been more likely to survive and reproduce. Um, so that's just kind of a short review of how evolution might have shaped psychology. But again, it is fairly controversial. And this is, I believe, the last slide that we touched upon last week, this idea of sexual selection. So sexual selection doesn't just pertain to humans. This is something that Darwin noted um, when he was doing his original research. So Darwin came up with his idea of sexual selection because he noticed that in between the sexes of two animals, so for example, here we're looking at the male uh, peacock and the female pea hen. And what he noticed was there was significant differences in the way that the males and the females of a certain species looked. And when you think about it, which of these two members would be more resistant to a predator, the one who has this huge, colorful uh, set of feathers, or this one that really doesn't have much uh, in the way of extra feathers. It's probably going to be this gal right here. And so that led him to wonder why in the world would the peacock have evolved this beautiful set of feathers, this beautiful plumage. And then what Darwin noticed, and this is talked about in the video, uh, if you watch it, what Darwin noticed is that those peacocks who had the biggest, most beautiful set of plumage, they were the ones who were getting more sexual access to the females. They were producing more offspring. And so he realized that the males of a species might face different kinds of adaptive problems than the females do. 
and that would lead them to evolve a different set of characteristics. And the example is really noticeable in birds, if you think about it, let's look at cardinals. Cardinals, you have the bright red bird as the male, the tan bird that would be more camouflaged is the female. So why in the world would the male have this really bright set of feathers? It's to attract the female. And of course, reproduction is the name of the game, so if you can attract a female, you're going to be better off. So when we turn to humans, what we see is that even among humans, men and women have historically faced different problems, and so therefore they have evolved different characteristics that enable them to deal with those problems. And so we talked in class about differences in minimal parental investment. So because females have to invest so much more time and so much more energy and potentially resources, because they invest so much more in their offspring, that might be the reason why they are so much, um, so much more picky and choosier about their mates. Because if a woman wasn't very choosy and she just mated with any old male, she might have gotten a dud. And so her kids wouldn't have been well cared for and would have died off. So the idea is that evolution would have selected for women who were pretty choosy and tended to pick the best men that were out there. And that choosiness would have been passed down to her offspring. Okay, so now I've advanced away from sexual selection over to a different theory, which is social role theory. Now I said earlier that this idea of evolutionary psychology is controversial. Not everybody agrees with it. So there are plenty of people who think that uh, many of our human behaviors uh, don't necessarily reflect evolution per se, but maybe reflect the role of culture. And so that idea is, uh, it somewhat comes through in this social role theory. So the idea here is that our particular behaviors uh, are passed down by our, our parents teaching us certain activities rather than just giving us genes that shape our brains social role theory argues that our behaviors especially the behaviors that differ between men and women um, get passed down simply because of the way our parents teach us so what we see when we look at men and women is that they fulfill very different roles and certainly this was true 500 years ago a thousand couple hundred thousand years ago um, our roles are starting to overlap now but way back there was quite a bit of gender differences and so males historically had been involved in what are known as agentic roles meaning they were the agents of change so they were in high status roles maybe a chief or a warrior um, and because they were in that high status role, they were trained to gain certain behaviors. In particular, if we look at these agentic roles, um, we're talking about people like Jack Donaghy from 30 Rock, who are CEOs or in charge. Um, we see maybe an agentic role could be Hillary Clinton, Secretary of State, Senator, um, George W. Bush, uh, President. So any of these roles require a certain set of behaviors. So if I want my child to grow up to be, a, um, to be in one of these dominant high status roles, what kinds of skills would I want that child to have? Well, I would need to train them to develop these particular skills right here. I would want a child who was able to um, exert control over the situation to be large and in charge, if you will. Um, I would train my child to be able to communicate very directly. This is what I want. This is what I need from you. Um, I would want to train my child to be very autocratic, meaning the, um, so an autocrat would be the single decision maker. I don't know if you guys remember, but a number of years back, uh, George Bush, uh, when he was being questioned about something, said, look, I'm the decider. I'm the one who makes decisions here, and that's very much an autocratic position. And so if we want somebody to be in a agentic role, a high status role, we need to train these skills in that child. On the flip side, women have tended to occupy what are referred to as communal roles. And so let me go ahead and advance down two slides to the communal roles. So a communal role tends to be subordinate, a lower status. So a communal role would be a teacher, um, a caregiver, a nurse, a homemaker. These are the sorts of roles that historically women have tended to occupy. 
So if I want my child to be a successful caregiver, I would want to train that child in these sets of skills. I need for my child to learn how to be truly cooperative and to get along with other people. I need my child to be really nurturing and so I'm probably going to encourage that child to um, play with pets, to play with dolls, um, to play with stuffed animals. I would want my child to be pretty compliant and we actually see this in female behaviors. Um, quite often women don't just make a decision in an autocratic fashion. Instead, um, they might say, oh, well, I don't know what I want to do tonight. What do you want to do? Even though a woman might know very well that you know, she wants to go out to eat, she might still ask her friends, oh, I don't know, what do you want to do? And so that reflects the fact that she's going to be compliant to social influence. We also see that people in communal roles are going to tend to be more dependent on others. And we see that in women as well, that they do depend on others for social support. Uh, and communication is going to tend to be indirect. Rather than saying, this is what I want from you, um, somebody in a communal role, particularly women, are more likely to say, um, you know, let's say I want my husband to turn down the, um, the air conditioning. I might not say, hey, sweetie, turn down the air conditioning. That would be way too direct. A more communal behavior would be to say, hmm, it's a little chilly in here, don't you think? So that's an indirect way of conveying what I actually want. And that's probably something that society um, and my parents had taught me to do so that I could be successful in this communal role. Okay, so now I'm going back up two slides and I asked the question of why might it have been that it was the men who tended to occupy agentic roles. It's not just some kind of random chance or accident that the men, the XY chromosome folks, tended to occupy agentic roles. No, it's because of some factors that have to do with their body size. Uh, most notably, they're bigger, they're stronger. It's easier for a man to be in a dominant role because he's physically able to dominate the women in his life. He's more physically able to dominate probably some of the other men in his life, or the animals in his life. So when you are bigger and you're stronger, in some cases you're more able to be in the dominant role. Certainly that was true a couple hundred thousand years ago. And also men are faster by virtue of their muscle mass. Men are going to be faster so they're better able to be in a warrior role than women would be. But we also see something else. Men are not tied down with children. Imagine if a man had to nurse a child for three years, he wouldn't make a very good warrior. If a man was pregnant for 10 months, he wouldn't make a very good hunter. I mean, can you imagine him running around eight months pregnant? No, that's just not going to happen. And so because of these basic physical characteristics, men were much more likely to occupy these agentic roles like chief or hunter or warrior. Now we have to think about a separate question. Why might women have tended to occupy communal roles? Well, it's kind of the flip side. They had a smaller physical size. Now, if I am smaller, I'm slower, I'm weaker, I'm not going to be quite as good a hunter as a man would. And in, if I am going to do any hunting, I'm probably needing to, to cooperate with other women in order for us to be successful. We're going to have to work together. And so then it's not surprising that women would have uh, developed these more cooperative skills. That's what their parents would have taught them to do so that they could be successful. Another thing is, look at this woman. She has at least one child who's sticking with her. Is this woman, like I said in the last slide, is this woman going to want to go to war? Of course not. Is this woman going to bust into somebody else's house and demand respect and demand that they listen to her? Probably less so because she would be worried about the danger to her child for doing that. So because she has these children, she's going to typically stay close to home. And if she's staying close to home, that means she's not going to be able to be a warrior. She's not going to claim great victory for her tribe. She's also going to tend to stay with other women who also have children. And so probably if she has to be in all this close proximity with other women, she's going to need to learn how to be more cooperative.